Hey everyone, my name is Dan Pontifrac. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now. Today in the house, what a friend, what a pal, and certainly insightful, Josh Burnoff. Josh is an expert on how business books can propel thinkers to prominence. Book projects on which he's collaborated have generated more than $20 million for their authors. Josh's most recent book is Build a Better Business Book, How to Plan, Write, and Promote a Book That Matters. We're going to dig into that today. He's also, however, the author of Writing Without Bullshit, Boost Your Career by Saying What You Mean, and the co-author of Groundswell, Winning in a World Transformed by Social Technologies, which is indeed when I discovered Josh. He's authored, co-authored, or ghostwritten, an additional eight business books. Josh works closely with nonfiction authors as an advisor, coach, editor, and ghostwriter. He's collaborated on more than 45 nonfiction books. Formerly Senior Vice President of Idea Development at Forrester, where he spent 20 years analyzing technology and business. And before Forrester, he spent 14 years in startup companies in and around the Boston area. He's got a math degree from the Pennsylvania State University, studied maths in the PhD program at MIT. He lives in Portland, Maine with his lovely, lovely wife, Josh. Welcome to this show. Um, you know, I think I'm a nonfiction business author, and I thought I knew what I was doing four books in, and then... You uh, gave me the alpha beta uh, arc copy, if you will, of the book. And I'm like, God, I'm terrible. I, I really am a horrible business book <laughs> author. Um, now, one of the books, or one of the books, one of the points that you make actually later on in Build a Better Business Book, I wanted to start at the back and come back to the front, mm -hmm. has to do about your own self-reflection. And so when you were co-writing Groundswell with our mutual pal, obviously, Charlene Lee, your takeaways in that section of the book, I wanted to start there. So let me play out the takeaways and then we'll have a chat about maybe just the whole thing. Books make money, but often not enough to support authors on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, weaving the content through these offerings, some free, some paid, et cetera, allows you to build on the ideas of the book to create a successful career because author makes authors, sorry, make money from speeches, consulting, training, generating leads, and a variety of other means. So if those are the takeaways, tell us a little bit more about the line of thinking. Because if I'm a potential business book author, I'm thinking, oh, I, I'm going to get a $50,000 advance from uh, Peng, Penguin Random House or, or Wiley, or I'm going to get millions in royalties. You're sort of painting a picture that might be contradictory, if not ironical, to why one would get into business book writing in the first place. Yeah. So first of all, it is possible to write a, a book proposal that generates an advance of fifty or $100,000. Advances are down, but they still exist. But if you are going to do that, you have to make the case that you will be able to sell, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 books. And of course, that requires investment of your own money. And, and you know, $100,000 is nice, but if you're going to spend two years of your life working on a book, that's not sufficient compensation for most authors to have a successful career. So the the payoff from the book, even from books that don't sell a huge amount, is that it boosts your prominence as somebody with a, a powerful idea in business. Mm. And if you are known as the expert uh, or the person who created that idea, you can get speeches, you can get consulting, uh, you can uh, raise the prominence of your company if you're working with a company. There are a lot of ways to generate revenue, but it all basically comes down to I'm the guy who created this idea or I'm the woman who created this idea. Um, the simplest way to put it is that a book is the largest possible unit of content marketing. And the principle of content marketing that you create useful content that attracts people to you and then you can make money from them. That's what's going on with book publishing. Mm. So you what I hear these days, right, and again, I'm uh, four books, just about to be five uh, business books in, is that the author, the business book author needs a platform. Are you referring to the, sort of the book being part of the platform? Is it the means to the end or the end to the means? Uh, yeah, uh, these days, especially if you're trying to attract an advance from a traditional publisher, you need an author platform. And no, the book is generally not part of the platform. The platform supports the book. So what is a platform? 
you give regular speeches or you have a column in a trade magazine or you have a newsletter that goes out to 75,000 people um, or you're, God help us, an influencer with 13 million <laughs> Twitter followers. OK, but uh, which, by the way, is worth approximately as much as 3000 people on LinkedIn these days. Yes. But but you need some way of making people aware of what you're doing and the size and power of that platform uh, has to get described if you're pitching a traditional publisher. And even if you're publishing outside of traditional publishing, then that platform is how you get the word out because the book without promotion will just lie there and it won't do much for you. Mm. Yeah. You kind of make the point in the book that, Hey, I've written a book. It's like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. But no, the, no, your whole no, point no. is like, please don't do that strategy. So tell us a bit about what works better or best even. Yeah. It's funny. I've worked with a number of authors and uh, where they, they work really hard. They finish the book. They turn the book into the the publishing process to copy editing. And then they're, they're like, that was great. Let's start <laughs> another book. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is when you plan the promotion. So what happens in the promotion, you need to get the word out to as many people as possible in a limited period of time about uh, the book and its impact. And I have like a five-step process for thinking about this. What's your positioning? That's It's P-Q-R-S-T. The P is what's your positioning. Q, what question does the book answer? R is reach. How are you going to get the word out to as many people as possible through, for example, doing interviews on podcasts? S is spread. What will you give the people who like the book that that they can share and spread out there and generate word of mouth? And T is timing. How can you make sure that all of that activity hits in a time period of two or three months around the launch date of the book? Yeah, that's another good point that you bring up. It's um potentially lost on authors, business book authors, right? It's write the book, go into a foxhole, uh, wait for pub day and then say, hey, the book is here. But you're also recommending sort of the things you need to be doing way before uh, you have started writing a word. So maybe even let's go back in time now, almost to the front of the book and the process that you're recommending. So what are, if you're being a conscious business book author, what are you doing from day one of the idea? Because what I really love is, um, just to belabor the point here, the best book ideas are simple but significant. Then you go on to say that they must also possess three other qualities, which I love, which is new, big, and right. So how do you get there? Well, uh, if you think you have an idea that's worthy of a book, the first thing to do is to talk to smart people about it and get feedback. Um, and it's people are worried that someone will steal your idea. It's much more likely that your idea is not good enough and it needs to get tested out in the marketplace. People who do speeches know this. They try stuff out and they're like, people love that. Or, or oh, I tried it this way. That didn't work. Mm -hmm. And they use it to develop the idea. You're right. The, the ideas that succeed, they are big. That is, they have a powerful impact for your specific audience. Um, they are right. That is, you have evidence for them, and that might be statistical, or it could be case studies, but some sort of evidence that they're they're right. And the most important is new. They have to be differentiated. Your book has to be the first book that something or other, um, and that makes it different from all the other books in the space that you're in. Um, the other thing about getting started that people don't think about is that you need to fuel the book with stories, mm -hmm. case study stories about the kind of people who you're trying to help and how people like that tried to do stuff and what worked and what didn't work for them. And that doesn't just happen. You have to put an enormous amount of effort into collecting those from your clients, from people you've heard about, from stuff that you've read about in the news um, reaching out and collecting those case study stories because of when you go to actually start to write, that's the fuel that makes it possible for you to create a book that's entertaining and interesting to read. What what I've noticed is um, the book, your book, uh, aligns really well to advice I received from Julia Kirby, uh, an HBR editor now on the 
uh, the HBR education, HBR education side of the house, mm. or HBR, HBR press, I should say. And anyway, Julia's voice was, look, great business books have three things. They have uh, evidence, ideally yours, so your primary research. They have practical techniques that come from you and your experience, and they have stories whether they're yours or the ones that you found and and you can you know tie in as a bow to your to your technique or your evidence and first of all your book has all three and so i'm sort of playing it back to you is like do you agree with julia's advice because it seems to be what you're actually playing out as the advice in your book yes i very much would support that and my first book was published at hbr so they're they're professionals at this stuff certainly um remember this is where the harvard business school case was invented so they understand the power of stories. But the piece I hadn't mentioned that you said that Julia is in favor of is advice. And yes, it's not sufficient to point out a problem. You should have a solution. So the person reading the book should say, oh, okay, here's how I should organize my IT department. Here's how I should position myself for a future that has AI in it. Whatever the problem is, you've given them some method they can use to address that problem. So back to new, big, and right, because this uh, kind of uh, multimodal Venn diagram you've got going on in the book, you also point out things like if it's not new, big, and right, it's going to be considered somewhere in between. And those in-betweens are words like you use, such as noise, fashion, trivia, minor, a knockoff, uh, which are wonderful descriptors of what not to do effectively if it's not uh, the combination of new, big, and right. So tell us a bit more for a real book to have those three important characteristics. What are you, what are you doing beforehand so that you aren't noise, minors, a dream, or knockoffs? Okay. So basically, you, you want to think about your audience. This is the way to make sure that the idea is big is to focus on a specific audience and know everybody is not an audience. It should be for, you know, senior executives in finance, or it should be for uh, entrepreneurs just getting started or whatever. Mm. Um, you need to focus on what is that question you're asking and what is the solution you're providing. Um, and you need to focus on what is the differentiation. The differentiation is interesting because um there are more, there's more than one way to do that. Your book might be the first one that has actual data from consumers, or it could be the first book that has clear step-by-step -step instructions with diagrams. Um, one of my favorite examples is Melanie Dietzel's book on content marketing. It's called the content yeah. fuel framework. And she's got this 10 by 10 matrix that you can use to generate unlimited content ideas. And I just thought, Oh, that's brilliant. This is the first book that has a practical way to generate unlimited content ideas. And even though there are hundreds of content marketing books, it stood out for that reason. Mm -hmm. One of the things you also point out, which maybe helps you with the new big and right when you're actually getting into the book, is that you say um, the, the I think you say the first chapter has to scare the crap out of people. <laughs> It's so, true. okay, what does that mean and why? <laughs> okay, so remember how busy people are. They have short attention spans and they're impatient. So your job in chapter one is to get them to want to read the rest of the book, and that requires scaring the crap out of people. There are two ways to do this, fear and greed. <laughs> so what does that mean? Fear. A fear book is a book that's like, Something bad is happening, and if you don't prepare for it, it will be bad. You know, like a book on data breaches is a good example of a book that would be based on fear um, uh, or a book on uh, crisis communication. Mm. Um, greed, which is a lot more common, is basically you have to do this. If you do stuff in this book, you'll generate more revenue. You'll be more productive. You'll be happier. Things will be better. And again, it's based on scaring the crap out of people that if they don't do those things their lives will be ordinary and their competitors will pass them by so either way once you've done that you, usually in chapter one you offer sort of a limited version of the solution mm -hmm. and the person will be like oh wow this is a big problem but you're promising way me ways to solve it i'm going to read the rest of the book now to find out what those ways are and then you have the opportunity to turn that fear or greed into actual actionable steps that you're going to describe. So I'm going to 
put you on the spot in a little bit uh, with my next book that's coming out. But oh, I, go took for it. A, I took a page from your book and tried to scare the crap out of people with the first chapter by setting it up both with uh, the framework that's there, the the impassioned plea that we're doing, quote, it wrong, and I'll get to what it is later, but then leaving them, right, with a hook, essentially, like, you should continue to chapters two, three, four, five, mm-hmm. because chapter one's not enough. Do you see, I guess, Josh, people using chapter one as the hook, but also giving it away for free so people buy a book? Is that a business strategy? Uh, sure. A lot of books will will give away chapter one for free. If you go right now to burnoff.com slash downloads, you can get chapter one of my book for free. Um, chapter one, generally, I mean, I, it's, I guess, let me put it this way. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to publish a book and then withhold information in there. People get angry. They're like, they're like, if you need to know more about this, call me. Cause I'm not going to tell you the real secrets here. I'm like, I paid for the book. Come on, tell me the secret. (laughs) But chapter one, if, if chapter one describes everything you need to know to solve the problem, that's not a book. That's a blog post. <laughs> okay. So, so if you're worried about giving away chapter one, because it's got too much juicy stuff in it, then you don't really have a book. You just have one sexy chapter. And we've all read these books where you're like, this sounds interesting. And then you read the rest of the chapters like what that again, and then that again, and then again, okay, this is not a book. It's just a repetition of the same thing over and over. That doesn't help the word of mouth for a book either. It kind of no, becomes in the no. don't buy this book category, right? Yeah. So um, back to your own advice and that of uh, the aforementioned Julia Kirby, you did primary research. And I was um, I was chuffed, as they say in England, right, to be included <laughs> uh, or asked to uh, participate mm-hmm. in said uh, primary research. So I had my um, ability to provide you with feedback on how it's like and what it's like as a business mm-hmm. book author. So, Josh, well, I guess... Were there anything that surprised you from the the data that you did procure? And if so, what was it? Or maybe even the highlights of some of the research that you conducted? Yeah. So for people who are listening, I uh, surveyed 242 business and other nonfiction authors, of which 172 had been published and 70 were still uh, uh, working on books that hadn't been published yet. And I did that because... It's great to have data, but also because my background as a researcher at Forrester meant that I felt insecure unless I had some actual <laughs> data to present. Right. Um, but uh, I did learn some things in there. Probably the most interesting thing that I learned was that people had, well, I knew everyone hated their publishers because that's just like anecdotal information that you get from if a, if there are three authors getting together, that's what they talk about. Um <laughs> But what I found out was that people who had hybrid publishers liked their publishers significantly more than people who had traditional publishers. Um, so hybrid hybrid publisher is one who you pay to uh, publish your book, and you get a lot more attention because you're the actual customer there. Um, I also wondered whether people were happy or unhappy with having written a book. And what I found in there was that 87% of the people uh, that had published books said that they felt that was a good decision and uh, almost 70% said that they expected to publish another book within the next five years. Mm-hmm. So uh, so it, this is telling me that for at least for the people I reached, it was generally a positive decision for them to have created the book, even with all the work that went into it. So I'm going to come back to one book or many books and your thoughts on that because you have a really good point to make uh, in the book, yours. But I want to actually open up that Pandora's box. Uh, I'm one of those authors of the um, 242 that has been with traditional with a couple books with mm-hmm. Wiley and now three books with a hybrid. I've never self-published, which is another avenue one could go, yeah. I suppose, right through KDP and so on. What's your what's your thoughts these days, I suppose, both in the research and just all the work that you do do with so many different authors on traditional hybrid and self, and then maybe expand a little bit on your definition of what hybrid is. Okay. So uh, I get this question all the time. No matter what an author is contacting me about, they first want to ask about this. So, so a traditional publisher, this is, you know, people like Wiley or Harvard business press or penguin portfolio uh, that will pay you in advance uh, uh, they'll 
accept your book, pay you in advance, and then publish it. And of course, it's much nicer to get paid to publish, but you have to produce a an extensive and very persuasive uh, book proposal, including a platform that shows that you have the ability to sell the book because these days publishers don't do that. That's the author's problem. Uh, and uh, you, the one of the main things that people don't think about here is the delay. It's typically 15 to 18 months between the time that you close the deal and when the book actually publishes. And a lot of authors, uh, business authors, just really want to get it out there sooner than that. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that the stuff you're writing about is, is technology-based and is becoming obsolete. Uh, a hybrid publisher works pretty much the same way as a traditional publisher, and the difference is that you pay them, uh, depending on whether you're doing a hardback book and manufacturing copies or print on demand, that cost can be anywhere from ten dollars to $50,000. Um, it turns out, actually, that if the book sells really well, you make out because you get a much higher royalty rate, and that can end up being much more profitable than it would have been with a traditional publisher. Uh, but uh, the other thing that's that's important there is that you can typically get the book out in six to eight months instead of twelve to, instead of fifteen to eighteen months, which is much closer to what a lot of people are looking for. And uh, uh, I'll just mention the names of some of the excellent hybrid publishers. Amplify is the one that published my book, as well as two of the books that I ghost wrote. Um, Idea Press is a fantastic publisher run by Rohit Bhargava. Uh, Wonder Well is uh is another excellent uh choice so is um page two which is a publisher out of canada um these are all excellent choices and my definition of a hybrid publisher is simply uh, a publisher that is selective but that publishes a book under contract to you and otherwise fulfills all of the other obligations of a publisher the the I was going to say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say figure one publishing, my also Canadian based hybrid uh, okay. <laughs> publisher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. I haven't encountered them and you should tell them to contact me because I'd like to know more about uh, yeah. publishers that, that they come recommended by an author like you. Um, self publishing is the easiest, fastest, cheapest way to do this, where you just basically write the book yourself and then put it up on, uh, on, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, typically, or through uh, the other alternatives through uh, in Ingram, um, Ingram Spark, uh, and th that can be the fastest way to do it. But it definitely makes less of an impact because you have to do everything yourself. You're it can be challenging to get everything right. Maybe it isn't the best cover. Maybe the you know you didn't get the right page layout professionals and it doesn't look quite right. Um, uh, and a print on demand book, which is what those usually are, uh, tends to uh, seem to have a little bit less quality. And uh, mm. certainly they're so, it's so easy to do that, that you don't distinguish yourself from all of the other, other books out there. Just as an example, both traditional and hybrid publishers can get you into airport bookstores if you make a deal to do that but you can't do that with a self-published book mm -hmm. um but if you're looking to get into print quickly and not to have a huge cost up front that's certainly one way to get started uh and uh if you promote the heck out of the book it can accomplish your goals even though it has a lot less impact than the other ways of publishing is it fair to say whether it's Ingram Spark or otherwise the POD also you are both the uh, writer, designer, promoter, and seller because ultimately hybrid and traditional have teams that will sell books to trades and so forth, right? Uh, that's true. Although bookstores are much less important than they used to be. Yeah. Even your your traditionally published book is is less likely to appear in uh, Barnes and Noble store. And if you, you know, just think about this as a book consumer, if you hear about a business book, do you drive over to your local Barnes and Noble store? And what is it? I guess in the UK it'd be a Waterstone, right? Um, is that where you figure out what business books are the ones you want to read? Yeah. You might look and say, Oh, has John Cotter published another book, but, but you're people almost always pay, uh, uh excuse me, buy online now. And that changes the dynamics. It makes 
uh, the uh, the publisher less important and the publisher sales force convincing, say, uh, uh, Barnes and Noble or or Amazon to buy copies is less important than it used to be. Coming back to platform author, you know, just who you are, you've uh, I have a couple of questions left. And, and one of these is got to do with your point that uh, you say that writing a book is an intellectual activity unlike any other. And you encourage the author, in essence, not to stop at one. So you and I are, what, masochists at five and you a slightly <laughs> larger one with all the other work that you do. So what's why the advice of not stopping at one and tell us a bit about what you would encourage authors to rethink in terms of their book strategy? Well, I... I don't so much encourage people to do more than one as observe that it tends to happen mm, okay. um, because uh, the intellectual rigor that goes into creating an excellent book, the research, the organization, the refining, the idea, the, the, you know, the, the feedback from readers, it, it creates something that you can't really create any other way. I'm sorry, but two blog posts or, you know, a, uh, a a video that you created on YouTube is not equivalent to what goes into making a book. Now, you can still do a crap book. Certainly, it's possible. But if you put that kind of effort in, and especially if you see that it generates a, uh, a, a positive response from readers and clients, you often say, oh, well, I'd love to do more about that. Um, and, you know, it's been what, seven years for me, eight years between the, no, it's seven years between the, the two books that I just, mm -hmm. I most recently published. So yes, life goes on and you have other things to do, but there's often this idea in the back of your mind, which is like, I keep seeing this thing. This looks interesting. I, I am right now percolating a big idea that has nothing to do with writing. And yeah, I'm in the midst of promoting this book. So it's just in the back of my head, but that's going to sit there and bug me until I research it and get it out because I want the world to know what I think about it. Well, it'd be fresh, new, big, and not uh, a poser for certainly it's, <laughs> it's Josh Burnup. Okay. So let me put, uh, let me ask you to put your book, business book consulting hat on for a second. So I just received arcs of a book that comes out in November called Work Life Bloom: How to um, Build How to Build How to <laughs> I can already know the name yeah. of my book How to Nurture a Team That Flourishes. So I'm an HRE leadership strategist guy. Mm -hmm. Book five. Here's the itch I was trying to scratch. It was back in 2019, before the pandemic, thinking about this term work life balance. Like, what the hell is it? Is it real? Is it fake? Is it fake news? Are leaders using it to almost nefarious ways to kind of create employee engagement in the organization? So I then had this um, idea like, well, I should I should test out what people think about work life balance. So I started doing like a like a comic or a comedian does, they test out material in little clubs, right? Before yeah, they go right. record the album or what have you. So I started doing talks in the US and Canada and Europe, mm -hmm. like little small groups, right? About this, not just the idea, but just teasing out things that came with some of the factors that I thought would be a better work-life balance. All right, so that's what I started doing. That was a couple of years, pandemic hits. Noodle it, noodle it. Then I went and did primary research. So hired a company, research analyst, uh, thought I could use you, but you don't work for Forrester anymore. <laughs> Just kidding. We, uh, so we went out, uh, 10,000 people, 11 countries, 5,000 wow. leaders, 5,000 wow. non-leaders, cost me 25 grand, but I wanted to make this impact on the credibility of the research I'm trying to prove is work life, kind of a X and Y axes. What are the factors that make up someone, I didn't use the word blooming at the time, but basically it's someone on the top right of the X, Y axes, right? And so of course I'm curating stories, I'm interviewing 200 people. And then I'm like, finally, okay, well, I think I've got data, I've got stories, I've got Dan X, Chief Learning Officer, Credibility from SAP Intellis. I'm gonna write this book. And I finally came up with the model, Work Life Bloom. And so what did I miss, Josh? Like, what am I doing wrong in the architecture, right, of the book? Or what did I do right? Well, first of all, 
it sounds really interesting. So, <laughs> so good. I think you're doing some things right. When it, the 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 detailed quantitative research is, I think, uh, potentially going to set this apart. And you asked a question that a lot of people are asking here, uh, especially these days about work life balance. So the the question now I have is the the question that you you brought up from your HBR contact, which is, do you tell us what to do about it? Mm. Um, and that's, that's sort of the acid test for me is if you can, uh, describe in one or two sentences what you learn and what we should do about it, then I think you're potentially on uh, a positive, uh, positive path. And the other question is, what are you doing to promote it? Because, you know, <laughs> this is the shoemaker's children here, right? I mean, it's very easy to say, oh, yes, everyone needs to do book promotion. And then you're like, oh, God, I have to get on 20 podcasts and I have to go and give a speech in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And, you know, it's, <laughs> so, I mean, it's work. But if you don't do it, this just becomes uh, something that sits on the shelf and doesn't have an impact. Yeah, you're right. So first of all, on question one, um, what are the five or six work and life factors that you need as an individual to bloom in both work and life? Because work enters life and life enters work. So what's the right computation, essentially? So that answers your first bit. Second bit, I've been since I read your book, you gave me, the, I say, the alpha or the R copy uh, before it was all pretty mm -hmm. at the word version, I think, the PDF. It was been you've been gnawing at me. You've been in my brain for like the better. I'm so sorry. A, a year. <laughs> well, you're sorry. <laughs> uh, it's been quite helpful, I have to say. And so a six month pre um, launch strategy was initiated with a four month post launch for the November 6th date. So there's a book pre order site. All my clients have got spiffs in which to do the pre ordering. There's a whole bunch of different keynotes and workshops that are associated with it. There's a free assessment that got launched. Oh, that's a great thing so, to, for people to share. That's a good yeah. idea. So I've caught like a thousand new people already that are now in the MailChimp because they're taking the free assessment. They yeah. find out if they're blooming or not. And then obviously they get the discount or promo to go buy the book when it comes out or do the pre-order. So I'm listening to you. That's what I'm just saying. I wanted to say thank you. It's like five books in. And I, you know, I cheekily told you um, that uh, Josh is Josh is so helpful because it's helped me realize I've launched bad books, <laughs> four previous bad books. So I just want to say oh, thanks. Please, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm All sure right, they weren't, weren't bad. I'm sure they were good. Maybe not perfect. <laughs> definitely imperfect. Definitely imperfect. Yeah. Listen, um, I love I love you. You're just such a, a real person out there. Um, where can we find more about great Josh and build a better business book? Okay, so if people want to find me, it's easy. You just go to burnoff.com, B-E-R-N-O-F-F.com. That's where everything is. Um, uh, thankfully, since my last book, I've changed my website, so you don't have to type a curse word in to get to it anymore. Um, burnoff.com slash books will show you the books, including this Build a Better Business book. And if you go to my blog at burnoff.com slash blog, that has a new blog post uh, of interest, mostly to authors, every single weekday. So, I mean, I'm not sure when this is going to get published, but I just did one about whether Sarah Silverman's lawsuit against these AI mm. uh, chat GPT type things is going to succeed. And the answer is it isn't. No, so, no. No. so always, always something new there five days a week. Um, and I would love to connect with people. There's a there's a contact form there. or You can just find me on LinkedIn. I'm really easy to to connect with there. Well, for years, Josh, you've been uh, not only writing without bullshit, but you've been living without bullshit. And so on behalf of all of us that have looked up to you and thank you for lots of free guidance. This book, uh, Build a Better Business Book, uh, How to Plan, Write and Promote a Book That Matters. It's just a significant piece of work. Thanks so much for that. We'll put all the links, et cetera, in the show notes. But uh, great to catch up. And again, congratulations on a better book. Okay, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening, watching. Reminder that there's always a Forbes column summary of our conversation with Josh. In this case, uh, thanks so much to the mighty Josh Burnoff. More next time. Thanks again, folks. <laughs>